Oh yeah? Cool. What's up guys, Alan Brock here, and it just hit me right before I started recording that I'm wearing the same shirt as last video, but I'm gonna be too lazy to change, so you just have to look at me in this gray shirt again. Last video, I asked you guys to send me some questions about anything, could be photography related, anything else. You guys sent them, and today, we're gonna answer those. I'm just gonna go straight down in kind of the order they're listed on YouTube, Instagram, wherever they came from, and I will do my best to provide some answers. All right, first question. Uh, Bill Howard says, great advice. Looks like I get to be the first question. So, did you and Mr. Horn battle it out in push-ups, and if so, who won? Fans of both of you have been anxiously awaiting the big format Battle of the Dark Cloth. So, backstory on this. Um, I've been lifting weights for a while and then Ben had an agreement with his wife that if he could do 50 push-ups and maybe 15 or 20 pull-ups, he would uh, have permission to get the new drone from, or the Mavic drone from DJI. Long story short, I think I talked some trash on Twitter and we kind of decided to have a push-up battle. That battle never actually happened in Zion because... Um, Simple answer is I wasn't in Zion very much this year. I actually stayed at his campsite a couple nights, but uh, it just didn't work out. So maybe we'll do it next year. I'm not certain who would have won that one, though. Um, I like to think I would have, but uh, he'd been training a while to do lots and lots of push-ups, and I've just been doing heavyweights. So he may have won that one, but um, we'll have to do it again next year. We actually had something really funny planned for that. That we weren't able to get to so uh we'll uh, we'll keep that in the works maybe for next year okay second question from bin bing zing i'd love to hear your advice on shooting sunset into the sun like how to expose which film best to use and perhaps also if you would shoot sunrise or sunset would you prefer to shoot into the sun or with the sun behind you um, another gear related question is could you please recommend a head torch for hiking and setting up in the dark uh, multiple questions there. Headlamp, I'll start with that. I use the Petzl Tika RXP. Um, it's like the one thing I didn't get uh, before setting all this up. So, Petzl Tika RXP, it's this guy. Um, the story behind that is once um, I was hiking with two other friends to Subway and when we pulled into subway really early in the morning the only other car there was actually ben's and um, we started out on the trail first and if you know the trail the part that dips down into the canyon that's where he caught up to us and his pack was much heavier than ours but he just took off and um, i could say that it's because he was in much better shape but i blamed it on the headlamp he had a really bright headlamp um, i found out which one it was bought it and i can't recommend it enough it is extremely bright. It has different levels of brightness, but what I like best about it is it has what they call the reactive technology. There's um, like an auto exposure um, meter or sensor in there. So in one of the modes, you can set it up to uh, put out very bright light, but if you pull up a map right in front of you, it'll dim. So uh, it's very, and, and then the technology actually really works. You know, auto exposure on cameras doesn't really work so well sometimes. But, um, you know, with, uh, with this, I guess it doesn't have to be precise. It's really very effective. You can set it up into red light mode or into a uh, just constant light where it's not reacting. But it's very, very good headlamp. Uh, it's a little bit pricey. Um, I think it's still $110 which is about what I paid for. There are much cheaper headlamps, but the technology in this really makes it worth it. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, shooting into the sun. So um, I don't do a lot of sunset or sunrise shots shooting into the sun. Um, the few pictures I do take around that time of day, usually the sun is at my back. Um, as far as preference, it's really just you know what composition is best. The one thing I will say regarding film choice is if you're shooting into the sun, use a color negative film. Um, I'll pop up a shot I had in the Smokies, but there's going to be such a, uh, such a difference in dynamic range of the part of the sky that has the sun versus the ground. So uh, color negative film will very easily be able to handle that. Don't try slide film at all. 
Uh, it's just not going to work out. But I don't have the most experience shooting that time of day because um, it's just hard to set up. Uh, hard to set up my uh, large format camera, even with the bright screen that I have on one of the cameras. Hard to set it up and shoot at that time of day. But my one piece of advice: use color negative film for its latitude and forgiveness. Okay, next question. Uh, Justin Fuller writes, what is your favorite spot to shoot in the Smoky, uh, Smoky Mountains? Hope your family has a great Christmas. Justin, you have a great Christmas too. All right, um, so in the Smokies, uh, my, I guess my favorite spot would be uh, a little place called Spruce Flats Falls. Now, if you have like a map, a trail map of the park, this is not going to be listed, even though it is a very popular waterfall, but if, uh, if you're familiar with the area, go to the Tremont Institute, park there, and you'll actually see maps and signs for it. It's a beautiful waterfall. It is going to be crowded, even though, like I said, it's not listed on the map. It's going to be crowded, but um, relatively short hike. I think it's a mile there, a mile back, and um, a really beautiful waterfall. Lots of, lots of compositions to be had there. Um, you know, the Smokies is difficult for me. I don't... There aren't that many iconic spots to shoot. You know, uh, Zion has like the Watchmen. Uh, there's all these icons at different national parks. The Smokies, um, you just kind of got to get get out there. So I don't have that many favorite spots, but good areas um, where you can find a lot of compositions, especially in the fall, or just if you can find a long river walk, like the middle prong, of the Pigeon River, that's a good place to start. Lots of compositions uh, in the river itself. Not necessarily a spot, but just anywhere up and down the river. So it's a little bit tricky and there are not too many iconic spots, but there are lots of places along rivers where you can get out and shoot. All right, so Landon Hill writes, um, I have a question about metering. I know you and Ben Horn have done videos on metering already, but I'm having a really hard time. I follow the technique about metering the brightest and darkest spots and then averaging, but every time I do this, my shots end up almost always underexposed. I'm also having trouble with low contrast scenes, like when there's cloud cover. Any tips? A um, little bit difficult for me to give concrete advice on this because a lot of times I'll go with feel on metering. I'll uh, measure the shadows, measure the highlights, come out with my average, and then if I feel that the scene needs to be a little bit brighter than what the number gives me, I'll just add a half a stop. But uh, in your case, and I'm not trying to be flippant with this, um, I, I would just expose a little bit longer. Um, and I do this a lot. If I, um, if, if I take one sheet and I feel that eh, maybe it needs to be a little bit brighter than what my meter gave me, I'll make the next sheet, you know, two thirds, two -thirds of a stop brighter. So if you're consistently having underexposure issues, then just take a second shot and maybe give that shot a little bit more exposure time. I do that a lot. Um, when I'm shooting doubles, my exposure time is very rarely the same between the two. If I feel that I'm missing somewhere or uh, that first one may be a little bit bright or dark, I'll adjust my second shot accordingly. Um, low contrast scenes, uh, first thing I would do is shoot Velvia on those. Velvia with its uh, higher contrast film uh, typically does very well with those. Ektar is much more difficult to scan in my opinion on low contrast scenes so I would say shoot slide film. And then one thing I'll do to check myself is I'll use the spot meter to get what I think is going to be the correct exposure. And then I'll switch my meter over to bulb metering since the light is pretty consistent. Uh, you'd mentioned on a cloudy day. Just take a bulb meter reading, see if that corresponds to what you got with your spot meter, and then go from there. But I would definitely, definitely shoot slide film on low contrast days. Okay, so Ross Blasting Game says, My wife and I are going to Zion for the first time in April. Any suggestions on areas or trails for the first time in the park day hikers who are also seniors? Easy to moderate hikes. Also, do you think the Narrows from the Temple is a good hike given the possibility of water levels in Aprils? I'll be carrying my medium format camera and associated gear. So, pretty heavy load, I'm assuming. Um, it's a good question because last year I went to Zion with my parents who are maybe in the senior-ish range. Don't tell them I said that though. Um, so, I kind of had to plan hikes accordingly because I was their tour guide. So, the first thing I'll say 
is right when you get into Zion, if you're going through Springdale, stop by Zion Adventure Company. It's going to be on the left, about a half mile before you enter the park. They have these excellent hiking guides that um, I'll just kind of show you here. It has all the major hikes listed and then these categories up here go over things like how long it's expected to take, the difficulty, all those things. It also has a map of the park itself and then each of the hikes are described in detail. Um, elevation change, distance, uh, some things to look for on the hike. So pick up one of these guys for sure. Make sure that's the first thing you do. As far as moderate hikes, um, some of my favorites are if you go to the northwest section of the park and you do uh, the Double Arch Alcove, if um, that's the middle fork of Taylor Creek, try to catch that one to where you'll be at your destination at noon. It's about a three mile hike in you'll catch some crazy reflected light, really beautiful at the end of that. And then, uh, like I said, it's three miles in, very, very gentle gradient. You're just hiking up a creek bed for the most part. Lots of river or creek crossings. Um, the creek may be mid ankle deep in April. It's not deep at all though, so no, won't really have to worry about that. But if you make that your, try to take a lunch maybe and do an afternoon hike there, and then you can drive further up the road to catch the Timber Creek Overlook. It's a great sunset spot. It's a half mile out, out hike, virtually flat. Um, those That makes a really good afternoon to do. One of my favorite off the beaten, uh, beaten trail hikes is Northgate Peaks. Now, as far as photography goes, it is completely dependent on if there are going to be beautiful clouds in the sky, so maybe not the best photogenically, but it's a two mile hike, uh, two miles in, really flat, you're gonna have it to yourself, and the viewpoint that you end up at is very beautiful. It overlooks kind of the main canyon area out in the distance, um, but it's just hard to photograph unless there are good clouds in the sky. Uh, the Narrows, now I haven't hiked the Narrows in the spring, but I will say that I kind of keep up with it, conditions and things like that, and it's hit or miss. A lot of times it's closed once the river reaches, I think, above 120 uh, cubic feet per second. I think they close it. I've hiked the river in 90, and it was borderline impossible for me. I'm a pretty, pretty strong hiker, so um, yeah, conditions in the spring with snow melt, not really conducive to hiking. Hopefully... You'll, uh, you'll be able to do it, but I wouldn't count on this trip being able to do the Narrows in the spring because it is closed quite often. Okay, NW10 photography, Northwest 10. Uh, says, first of all, thanks for the inspiration. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, getting me into large format as well as your videos. I really find them informative and enjoyable to watch. I would like to know if you were given a challenge to shoot six sheets of film, three color, three black and white, and you could only use one camera, one lens, what would your kit be and what would you shoot? Have a lovely, lovely Christmas and New Year. Looking forward to more videos. So Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you as well. Oh, tricky one here. I would go with the Shinhao with the bright ground glass as my camera. Uh, lens choice is easy, 90 millimeters. Um, that's how I just, I see something about that lens in the 4x5 format is just the way I see things. It's just wide enough. Uh, it's my go-to lens. About three-fourths of my shots are with that lens. Three color films. Um, I'm going to go with two of those being Ektar and one being Velvia. I enjoy shooting Velvia more, but Ektar is more versatile. Um, the three black and white, I'm going to stick with Delta 100. What would I shoot? Um, okay, so since this is kind of a hypothetical scenario, uh, hypothetically, I'm going to shoot the Narrows on a completely empty day. No other people in there. That would uh, that would be my ideal scenario. But uh, I, I guess in all seriousness, what I would shoot, um, I'm going to go with something new, and I'm going to say I'm going to shoot the Canadian Rockies. That's a trip I have coming up maybe next year, uh, if not the year after that, with a good friend of mine. So... I'm going to shoot someplace new, so to answer your question, I will shoot the Canadian Rockies. Okay, um, alright, so David Fern asks, Hi Alan, I think you're planning on working with 8x10 next year with Intrepid. 
If so, how are you planning for this? Black and white only or color too? Any thoughts? Welcome, since I'm contemplating myself. Keep up the good works. Thanks for that, David. Uh, yes, I have ordered the Intrepid 8x10. I wasn't one of the first 40 or 50 backers. Uh, I think those are shipping out actually right now. So I'll probably get mine toward the end of January. I'll say right off the bat, in no way do I picture myself becoming an 8x10 shooter. Um, just kind of my style of shooting in this most recent trip, I, I really want to push shooting large format into more obscure areas. And the 4x5 is just the perfect camera for that. It's so lightweight, but still gives incredible quality. Uh, so I don't in any way see myself becoming a serious 8x10 shooter. I backed Intrepid. Um, one, I, I do want to shoot 8x10, but mostly just to support them as a company. Um, what I plan to do with the 8x10, though, is strictly black and white in the beginning. I have a single lens, 240 millimeters, and three holders. I'm going to shoot black and white just because uh, the color film is just so... It's really cost prohibitive, especially considering it's not a format I'm going to be shooting very seriously. Um, you know, I'll probably stick with shots not not far off the uh, the beaten path with that because I don't even know if my backpack is going to be wide enough for the camera to slot down in there so uh, it's going to be a challenge honestly I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to shoot with that I'll have to see uh, kind of how 240 millimeters exactly what that's going to be good for on the 8x10 I'm not sure myself so uh, I'm looking forward to it I'm looking forward to the new challenge new experience of shooting a uh, really a new format, but I, I just don't see myself being a, uh, a serious 8x10 shooter. I'm going to be 4x5 for a long time. Okay, Jared Tobeck writes, questions on or question on hiking, mainly on certain clothing you wear for winter hikes and any extras you would take. Okay, so the key in winter for me is, and you'll hear this from a lot of people, is layering. Layers, layers, layers. You never want to sweat when you're hiking in the winter. Um, it'll keep you warm initially, but then when you stop, all that moisture will get you much, much colder than you would be. So you want to get right up until the point where you're warm but not sweating. If you feel yourself starting to sweat, shed a layer. So I start with my base layer. It's this capoline material from uh, Patagonia. And I take two base layers with me. I take their middle weight and then their heavier weight. I do most of my hiking in the middleweight base layer and I sleep in the heavier weight one. Um, this stuff is really great. It keeps you warm, it's breathable, it wicks, um, and it's very, very wearable in a wide range of temperatures. It can be very cold and very warm. Uh, you're not going to sweat. It's going to keep you really, really comfortable. Um, that's going to be my base layer. Typically, on top of that, I'll wear a, a pair of climbing pants like Prana pants. Um, that's it for my lower body. And then on the upper body, I uh, will wear like some kind of shirt on top of that, uh, some kind of sweater shirt or something like that. And then um, in the mornings when I'm first starting out, I've got a down jacket. This is the Mountain Hardware Ghost Whisperer. Incredibly light. Not the warmest down jacket in the world, but it's uh, very light. Um, that's typically how I'll start out. Usually I'll shed this. Uh, just before I start hiking because I don't want the uh, shoulder straps or uh, waist belt to cut into this. Um, and then I'll shed layers as you go along. Usually, even it, it can be down in the 20s and about half an hour into it, I'm down to just that uh, middle weight base layer. Uh, I, I get really warm while hiking. So the important thing is to layer while you're hiking. Now, you had asked about other things you take. Um, I sleep very cold at night, so I have to do everything I can to stay warm at night. So my extras are, I actually take two sleeping pads. Um, my main sleeping pad is this guy. It's the NeoAir X-Therm. It's the warmest sleeping pad on the market. And when you inflate it, and then you can rest your hand on it, about five seconds after that, you'll hear, you'll hear. You will feel the heat start to radiate up into your hand. It, it's really very effective. But um, when it gets really cold, and for me really cold is anything in the teens or single digits. Um, I, I don't really go out beyond, or when it gets lower than that, I'm just not set up for it. 
But when it's in the teens, you're predicted to get in the single digits at night. I will also take this guy. It's the Thermarest uh, Z-Therm, Z-Rest. Uh, just your closed cell foam, indestructible, doesn't soak up water. I'll put this uh, on the floor of the tent, the X-Therm on top of that. And the, the way these work is when you stack pads together, there are values, how warm they are, uh, are cumulative. So anything you can do to separate yourself from the ground, because that's where you're going to lose most of your heat at night, um, anything you can do to add space between you and the ground is going to be very effective. So this weighs, you know, eight ounces or something. It doesn't add very much weight. So I stick that in the pack, and it's been very effective at keeping me warm. Um, last thing I'll say is right before I go to sleep, I eat. If you have something on your stomach, uh, you're much more likely to stay warm during the night. So, hope that helps. Okay, Matthew Saville, Saville, I butchered that, I'm sure, uh, says, Oh man, so many questions. Well, I know you've already talked about vlogging itself. I would love to hear about your vlogging workflow, including storage, production, how long it takes, and how it goes together with your film development, turnaround time, and post-production. Also, how do you stay motivated between such amazing adventures and the high they inject into your life? Um, I'll answer the last question first. That was a real problem for me, especially a couple years ago. Came off of Zion and then just crashed because I had nothing, uh, nothing to photograph. You know, it's winter time, which is kind of a downtime landscape-wise anyway. Um, how I've kind of overcome that is I've started planning out these long-term projects and doing just little bits to research that or you know testing gear things like that so it's always in the back of my mind I'm just always looking forward to something um, what's occupying my mind right now and I'll go over more of this in a different video is kind of things I can do to grow the YouTube channel and putting a lot of effort into that so I'm really excited about that but I've had to kind of manufacture ways to keep my attention because you do kind of run into a little bit of a Maybe depression is a strong term, but uh, a lull where you think, man, I don't have anything to photograph. I've just been in this beautiful place. So it's something I've actively tried to work to to avoid. And uh, honestly, this year didn't feel a, uh, a, a crash at all afterwards. It was probably because I was so exhausted after the trip. But um, yeah, uh, there are things I've done to... Uh, to definitely, um, definitely stay stay motivated in other areas regarding photography. Uh, let's see, I've already forgot the other part of the question. Um, oh yeah, my vlogging process. Okay, so a lot of you will laugh because I'm very bad about uh, delaying videos, but when I'm on top of my game, here's how vlogging goes. Uh, take all the data and I'll dump it onto my hard drive. I've got a five terabyte external drive. That's where I keep all my videos. Um, Typically, I will uh, make separate folders for each day, and then I'll put them in Final Cut Pro. That's the editing software I use. While my film is being developed, what I'll do is kind of skim through all the footage of a particular day. And I'll kind of try to get a feel for the day, the story I want to tell, how I want to tell that story, whether it's going to be voiceover or whether I talked enough during the day to move the story along. Um, then after that, the most important part by far for me is picking the music. I use a service called Epidemic Sound. Um, it's a, like a $15 a month subscription and then all the music you want uh, royalty free. Uh, that to me is the most important part. Uh, music audio sets the tone of a video more than anything I can do talking. So once I've found the music, I'll, uh, I'll start to piece together the videos. Uh, typically by this this point I've either developed all the black and white film or the color film has come back. Um, so I'll get the video together, watch it a couple times, make any last minute tweaks, and then upload it to YouTube. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really the most efficient or effective vlogger, but like I said, when I'm on top of it, that's kind of the process that I use. Okay, Tony Pierce says, here's a backpacking question. I would think it would be hard for you to go backpacking without some type of camera gear. Do you go full frame digital to save weight when you go out with a full pack? Uh, this is a perspective of long distance hike. I love taking my full frame mirrorless digital camera on long trails. Just wondering if you do the same. Um, yeah, I, I don't hike much without either the vlogging camera or uh, vlogging plus my 4x5. I, I don't take any other camera ever 
if I'm not doing video uh, or not shooting film, I'm not taking camera. I'll take some iPhone shots. I don't do many of those hikes, but I do like to just get away from time to time um, without doing video about it just to be outside. Um, I, I cover ground much faster that way. Obviously, it's lighter. I'm not having to do those shots where you set the camera down and hike away and then go back and get the camera. Um, so it's just much more efficient. I can cover more ground, see more things, quicker to set up. Um, so those hikes are enjoyable, but I really like the storytelling, bringing you guys along. Um, you know, that's, I like living vicariously through other people that do that. So, um, you know, I, I like to kind of pay that forward and share my adventures as well. So I, I do like videoing it, but I, I don't take any kind of digital along for stills or anything like that. It's either video or video and film. Okay, Arcana, Arcana 73 writes, besides Zion and surrounding areas in the Smokies, what other places have you gone backpacking or plan to backpack? So when I first read this question, I uh, had to think for a second, I have never backpacked out of the Smoky Mountains and the Zion area ever. So I definitely need to expand my horizons. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier, but I really, really enjoyed this trip uh, that we just took where it was just exploring in the wilderness off the beaten path. That's something I want to uh, look more into, find some more areas that uh, not a lot of people go to that also have some photography potential. Um, a couple items on the bucket list. I want to go photograph Yosemite and explore it. Um, the the tough part of that is I also want to climb in Yosemite. So, you know, getting my very limited time set to where I could maybe photograph and do a little climbing is uh, is the challenge there. I have been to the Grand Tetons once. I want to go back and shoot it on film and backpack and hike there. I'm a little leery about it though because I am not comfortable with grizzlies. Black bears, um, I can see a black bear and barely blink an eye. They don't bother me at all because um, I have so much experience around them being in the Smokies. Grizzlies and uh, moose, when you're in their territory, that that spooks me a little bit. So I'm going to have to do some research on things to do uh, with that. So uh, that, that kind of keeps me from just jumping into a trip in the Tetons and like I mentioned, the Canadian Rockies. But um, those are places on my goal uh, or goals I have to shoot. I do want to at least visit Death Valley. I, I just want to take the classic racetrack shot. Uh, that, that's something I want to do. And other shots as well, maybe a dune shot. But uh, at least once in Death Valley. But to, I guess, put it in order. Uh, Tetons, Canadian Rockies, Yosemite, Death Valley, and then whatever else is out there. <laughs> C. Miller 15 writes, possibly the best question I got. If Velvia and Ektar fell off the edge of the Flat Earth tomorrow, which films would you shoot? So the Flat Earth thing, just go back and watch my Eclipse video from this summer. And uh, don't even watch the video, just read the comments. It will blow your mind. Um, but anyway, it says, uh, If Velvia and Ektar fell off the Earth, do you shoot? what would you shoot? And do you shoot any other formats besides 4x5? Uh, are you tempted by the 8x10? So yes, on the 8x10, I'm awaiting it. I do load up a uh, some 35 millimeter uh, HP 5 Plus from time to time just to document family things, um, but I don't really shoot that. I'll, I'll go a few months between shooting that, and I'll shoot a couple rolls and then set it aside. Um, that's really the only other film format I shoot. I don't even own a medium format film camera. If Velvia and Ektar fell off the Earth, what would I shoot? First of all, I think that's a very real possibility with Velvia. Ektar, not so much. I think Kodak is finally healthy as a company. Um, I think Fuji's healthy as a company. I just don't think they care about film. Um, so I'm just expecting that announcement any day, uh, at which point I will spend my life savings stocking up my freezer on Velvia. Jennifer doesn't know that, so don't tell her. But um, if they fell off, I would shoot just Delta 100. Um, no other color films interest me. I, I don't want to shoot Portra. Uh, I don't want it to be washed out. And um, Provia, I've never shot before. don't have any desire to shoot it. So uh, I would just become a black and white photographer. But I, I may be wrong, completely wrong, but Vel Velvia will be here for a couple more years at minimum. And Ektar, I anticipate it being here for the long run. 
Uh, M. Strickland images, right, how'd you get so ripped? Steroids. Um, what is it about Peter Lick that inspires you so much? So, with Peter Lick, I look at everything he does, and then I do the opposite of all of those things, and that's how I stay inspired by him. Um, yeah, picking on Peter Lick is like low-hanging fruit, but it's, it's fun to do sometimes. So, he's a master marketer, though. I'll give him credit. Uh, ben Horn writes, how do you think doing both video and large format photography affects your photos? When I read this question, I, I had to think about it for a bit because I haven't shot large format a lot without doing video. So my whole large format and vlogging experience kind of parallel each other. Um, I will say that shooting video has opened up a lot more compositions for me. There's two in particular that I've found, two shots that I have, where I saw the shot as I was hiking through on the video and then the next year went back and shot it. Um, so it has made me, at least watching the videos, has produced, uh, produced two shots for me. But I think doing the video has, it sounds weird to say, but I think doing video has slowed me down even more than doing large format. Um, because if I'm just in an area, then I'll be constantly looking for B-roll shots. And then I may find a B-roll shot and decide, oh, I want to shoot that on large format. So doing video has definitely, um, definitely made me a better photographer. I don't know how it would be different if I was just shooting large format film and not doing video. I don't know if it would be much different, but um, I, I see things more because I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm looking for video shots and I'll see, you know, compositions that will work for film. So it's, uh, I really enjoy doing the video now. It's really, really something that I look forward to growing and doing more consistently. Um, but also doing it as part of uh, photography because that's, that'll always be number one for me. Great picture of the monochrome walls. Let's see. Uh, RJ Agrin. RJ Grin. Have you thought about doing large format astrophotography? Yes. If you don't follow me on Instagram, I uh, you won't know this, but I shoot astrophotography too. Attach a camera to a telescope, and uh, do, just follow me on Instagram. Anyway, yes, I have thought about that. Uh, two main problems: impossible to focus. Um, I have no clue how I'd focus. And um, so the image circle from a telescope, even I've got a, um, I'll just say it, I've got one of the nicest telescopes they make. The image circle is so small that uh, there's no way it would take up, it would show the 4x5 film. So I've thought about it just as kind of a gimmick to do, but it's just impossible. Um, and I would need probably some 800 speed film at the minimum and no light pollution at all. It's just a bad idea. But I still may try it. Okay, last question. I've kind of covered it. Who won the Zion push-up contest? Is this the real reason Ben Horn photo didn't go on the trip with you? Yes. I can't confirm that, but yes, that is why he did not go. Um, <laughs> no, he didn't go because he's a sane person and uh, didn't want to follow me on some crazy harebrained adventure. I will invite him next time still, though. I'm going to get him to go on one of these. Um, so that's it, guys. Thanks so much for uh, sending me questions. I've enjoyed this. It's probably something I'll do maybe every year or so. Um, I get questions from time to time. So just to group them all in one video seemed like a good idea. But uh, if you're watching this video when I release it, it's close to Christmas. I hope you have a Merry Christmas, had a Merry Christmas. All that good stuff. Enjoy your family and friends. Thanks for watching. Give this video a like. Subscribe if you haven't. And we'll see you next time.